what I'm going to be talking today about, and some sellers, you're going to agree with me. Others, you're going to disagree with me. Um, but I polled my whole team here. We're like 25 people strong now about how you can prepare for post-COVID success and not just getting to Hong, Hong Kong so you can really feel those blankets and pillows yourself. Uh, but as an Amazon-based business, what is it you should be doing now to prepare for success after this crazy pandemic? So uh, that's what I want to talk about tonight. Should I get jump right in? Should I go? Yes, go. All right. All yours. So here's the overview. And I'm, I, I tend to talk really, really fast. Um, so if you need me to slow down, let me know. We're going to be talking about whether you should sell now if you have your own brand, because I believe there's a bubble. So do you want to sell your brand now or do you want to stay put? I'm going to be talking about a litigation update when you should absolutely stay out of court and also when you should consider going to court. And also, we are seeing a huge, huge uptick in the number of lawsuits filed against individual sellers and also a huge uptick in the number of lawsuits where you'll have like one brand that sues dozens or even hundreds of sellers at the same time. The record we see so far is 869 sellers were sued all at once. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about getting your money and your inventory back from Amazon. As you heard Chelsea talk, there are huge problems with Amazon logging in your inventory. And as the, the log jam has increased, the numbers of mistakes at Amazon has increased. The amount of shoplifting over at Amazon has increased. So how do you get your money and inventory back to make sure you're successful? Because if you don't get your money in your inventory, you can't succeed. Many of you sellers have developed your own brands, so we're going to be talking a little bit about brand protection. Uh, protect what you've built. Make sure other people aren't stealing your sales or harming your consumers. We're going to be talking a little bit about diversity and diversification of sourcing, product line, where you're selling. Um, the latest, of course, in plans of action, IP complaints, about 40% of my awesome team's work is writing plans of action for Amazon sellers, when your listing gets knocked down or your account goes down. Um, and also, there's a lot of new stuff going on in terms of the shelf space with Chelsea talked about. And also, Amazon making phone calls to you and verbal plans of action with Amazon staff. So first topic is about whether you should sell, like get money from Thrasio and SellerX and former brands, forum brands or whether you should stay put. And I just want to go, it's a little bit of an entrepreneur's history lesson. Okay, so the flowers, back in the 1600s, it, uh, there was a Dutch tulip bubble where the price of tulips went up 20X, not like just Grant Cardone, 10X your life, but the tulips went up 20 times their value. And the next year, they dropped 99%. Then you get to like the roaring 20s in the United States, right? The jazz, the drinking, pre-war, the expanded use of debt. The Federal Reserve was established. Consumer credit like exploded. And then it was a huge crash. Black Thursday when people were like jumping out of buildings. Back in the late 90s, you had the dot-com bubble, okay? Boo.com, 135 million, pets.com, floors, broadcast, which is where Mark Cuban made his money before that domain doesn't even exist anymore. Cosmo, Excite. There was a huge dot com bubble. Then, you know, those of you who are uh, a little bit younger, the first bubble you might remember is the mortgage bubble. Um, there was a big movie made about it called The Big Short, how they were chopping up mortgages. And the value of real estate just exploded and exploded and people were buying and flipping and then it collapsed. OK, and then I know this is a bit long winded. Uh, they get to today. Right. And you have the rise of the Amazon aggregators. And that's a real T-shirt, OK, that you refer a seller to one of the aggregators and they're going to give you a free Tesla. So I believe it is a huge bubble. And I'm really afraid that it's going to burst. So here's the history 
of the value of an Amazon based business or an Amazon based brand. And you can look at like Empire Flippers. They've been in the business for a really long time. They're really reputable people. They've spoken at uh, global sources, uh, I think back in 2017, 2018. And the value of your business or your brand has historically been less than the value of a brick and mortar business because Amazon can shut you down. They can spend your best listing. They can lose your inventory. There's a lack of control. So the value was always historically less than a brick and mortar business because you don't really own much, right? So for years, it was always two to two and a half times your annual net. And if you were getting that money, you were doing really well. Well, 2019, 2020, the aggregators are coming in. There's boatloads of money. You got their pandemic. Your sales are skyrocketing. Typical retail is like getting slaughtered. They're getting shut down all over the country. So the value of your Amazon-based brand went up a lot, where instead of two to two and a half, it's now two and a half to four times your annual net. Now, your sales are the same. Your, your margins are the same. Your ROI is the same. But because there's more and more money in the marketplace, the value goes up. Now we get into this crazy year. And this is really over the last few months that we are seeing deals at up to like six, six and a half percent your annual net. There is so much competition to buy your Amazon based brand that it has literally like tripled in value with the same fundamentals. And I want to take a moment to, to stop and just address something I didn't put in the slide. Um, we represent Amazon businesses who are selling. And if you're selling a business, here's the goal of the lawyer to cover your behind. Get your money, get your money, okay, and then limit your risk, all right? And we've heard of some lawyers charging like fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 to represent you as a seller, and it's ludicrous. I had an Amazon, uh, this guy who's done, who's been in our business for a while, call me up that he wanted to work with us. And he told me he was billing the people selling the businesses up to $25,000. And I thought that was absolutely a huge ripoff. Okay. But anyway, we get back on topic. So there's this huge, huge bubble. The value has practically tripled. Now, while the value has been going higher and higher and higher, you're facing issues with your factories because there are plenty of factories in China that don't have staff because of the pandemic. So there's less production. You have tremendous supply chain problems all over the world. If your packaging is being made in Vietnam, for example, and they can't get the ink because they can't take the ink from India. All of a sudden you can't get your packaging and the whole supply chain falls apart. The shipping costs have practically doubled to get a container of goods from Asia to California, the price is almost doubled. Then it gets there and it's sitting out in the ocean. And there are tons of disputes going on right now because the shipping companies think you should pay for it. But your contract says your costs don't start until it, they get onto the land. So who's absorbing those costs? And then with this whole limited bandwidth thing, you have the risk. Amazon is stepping up the game and absorbing bandwidth. Walmart is buying shipping. Uh, Costco, they're absorbing the limited ability to get goods into the United States. So this hasn't yet affected the value of your business in terms of what the aggregators are paying. But eventually, listen, I, I, I am an eternal optimist. OK, I always see the glass as half full, always. But I got to recognize and tell you that eventually the house of cards, you know, it may tumble. So my advice, OK, is to sell your Amazon based brand, sit out of the game for a couple of years. The non-competes are relatively short. You're looking at like one to three years. I advise you to sell. OK, you could always rebuild later. And they say, like, you know, in your 20s, you know, everything and your 30s. You realize you may not know so much. And in your 40s, you're like, I don't know, shit. Sorry, Megla. In the 50s, you're like, yeah, I really don't know anything at all. Um, but I would suggest that you really seriously consider selling your Amazon-based brand because the value is really high and the risks have really never before uh, been present. And which leads me to the freebie uh, that we're going to give 
anybody and everybody attending this summit, if you email me, this is our first on-demand course, and it's all about how to add more value to your Amazon-based business. And so it's our first launch. If you email me, I'll send you it for free. It has like a seven-day access. So that's our freebie for the course. And I really think that if you if you have an Amazon-based brand, if you have people sniffing around to buy, um, get out before the bubble bursts, okay? You might be profitable at the value of the business is likely to go down, I would say, over the next, I don't know, three to six months. It, it, it's got to. Some of the aggregators are already having some issues. All right. Next topic to succeed in a post-pandemic environment um, really follows the, the maturation of the Amazon-based business, okay? Now, the third-party system has only existed now for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. It exploded tremendously. And as that has occurred, you folks as business people and your businesses have matured. We're private label to full-fledged brand, owning intellectual property rights, protecting yourself, brands getting upset with you because they're kind of trying to protect their territory. So litigation has become a, a fact of life for Amazon sellers. You can't get around it anymore. It really is there. So when should you sue? Okay. Well, you should not sue unless the litigation is likely to provide you with a significant profit on the costs and the time of the litigation. No lawyer, anybody should ever rush you into court without first doing the math. Chelsea was talking about algorithms to calculate your inventory, how to make sure you maintain your shelf space. All those things that, um, all those things that business owners do to calculate your math, you actually have to apply to litigation as well. If it's not calculated under the three to five X rule, never pursue the litigation. Okay. What is the three to five X rule? The, the cost of your litigation, if you win, that's a big if sometimes, should result in three, in at least three times to five times your cost of the litigation itself. All right. Now, there are other reasons why you might want to go to court. We're representing a, a an Amazon seller right now that sources products from brick and mortar pharmacies, and they sell genuine health and beauty products. And they had this brand just pounding them with complaint after complaint after complaint. The initial evaluation was, okay, if we win, are we going to recover three to five times your cost? And the answer was yes. So they were losing a boatload of money. The side benefit that we have, and now other sellers are considering this, is that as soon as we stood up and started that lawsuit, the complaints stopped. None of their listings have been suspended from IP complaints and their account. We got it back up. And it's never gone down again. So I certainly wouldn't start a lawsuit solely to stop people from making complaints. But I can tell you, it works. When you stand up and all of a sudden they got to pay lawyers, they're on the defensive. You know, it does have a very, very strong effect that you're willing to stand up and not take that kind of stuff uh, from a brand, a competitor, a, anybody, okay, that you will fight back hard. It does stop the complaints. All right. The, the next stage of litigation that you're going to face in a post-COVID world, and it's already geared up tremendously, is Amazon sellers getting sued by brands and also by the brand's authorized brand protection entities. So how does that all work? So what happens is you get a brand like Peanuts, you know, like Charlie, uh, Charlie Brown and Snoopy and all that kind of stuff. They start lawsuits and they almost always start the lawsuit in the Northern District of Illinois. That is the federal courthouse in Chicago. They sue you in secret. They go back to the same judge in secret and convince the judge that unless the judge freezes all of your assets and your entire business, the world is going to stop spinning on its access and Snoopy will never recover, right? And the judges in this particular courthouse issue more temporary restraining orders than all of the other courthouses in the entire country when it comes to Amazon sellers combined. It is absolutely crazy. 
uh, how easy these judges are at, at freezing your businesses and freezing your accounts. Um, it real bo really boils down to it. And I'm not shy, even in front of judges, okay, that this has turned into legalized extortion. So if this happens to you, what they're going to try and do is say, okay, uh, we froze $20,000 of your money. We froze $50,000 of your money. We want half of it. And then we'll release you. Even if your sales of the Snoopy products are like nothing, right? Don't do it. Tell them, no way, I'm not doing it, and stand tall. Don't allow yourself to be extorted, and they bow down. So what we're doing on these cases is as soon as we are hired, we are bringing two motions to the court, two of them. One, to dismiss the entire case, okay? Your case has no merit. The court has no jurisdiction because if you didn't sell products into the state of Illinois, if you don't live in Illinois, you don't own property in Illinois, the judges in Illinois don't have power over you. And you can get the whole case dismissed if the court lacks jurisdiction. Also, we go to the court. We say, you know what? Dissolve the temporary restraining order. Under the law of the United States, a temporary restraining order issued after one side talks to the court is what the court calls the most draconian thing it could do before anything has been proven against you. So we asked the court immediately, take away that draconian imposition and also dismiss the case. Because you know what, Judge? I don't care what they claimed. You don't have jurisdiction over our client. And this is the, 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 the modern age of retail on Amazon. If you're not in litigation now, if you're selling another brand's products, chances are you're going to get there. Okay, next thing to succeed. Um, is getting your money back from Amazon, getting your, your inventory. So Jeff has boatloads of money. I put a picture of his rocket ship. I kind of like that he made it phallic in a way. I find that Jeff has the biggest rocket in the world. Um, and also you have uh, the Lufthansa heist. If any of you have seen Goodfellas, Bernie Madoff, the Dunbar on robbery. This good looking bald guy is the broker in Hong Kong who lost like two billion dollars. And I got to tell you that I don't think any of these guys, any of these heists hold a candle to the amount of money and the amount of inventory that Amazon takes that you own, that you paid for, that you sent to Amazon. I used to keep a, a running tab. Uh, next to my desk. And I was up to like the tens of millions of dollars within like a month. You know, they keep your $7,500 because they hit you with an authentic, but you have other accounts. Uh, they lost $10,000 worth of inventory. You sent in a few pallets of Apple, um, what are they called? AirPods, right? And they disappeared. Uh, I guess about uh, two months ago, we got a call from an Amazon employee, uh, a former Amazon employee. And he was all pissed off that he got fired. And so we're talking to him about, you know, can we help him with the claims against Amazon? I don't remember if it was age discrimination or sexual harassment. But as we're talking, they start talking about how there was a feeding frenzy before Christmas last year. A pallet of AirPods came in and the staff was stealing the AirPods and they were finding empty boxes in the bathrooms. They were passing them out of the smoking yard through the fence, right? So a lot of times you'll ship your goods to Amazon and Amazon's own staff is stealing the inventory. And then Amazon protects the inventory it owns in an entirely different fashion than the inventory that you sent in. So what am I getting at? So you have lost inventory. You have this nonsense of disposed inventory as if Amazon is throwing anything out. You have Amazon claiming that you mislabeled your pallets, right? That you didn't put it on all the sides and on top. And you have the theft right over to Amazon. And what do you do? Like, how can you make a profit? How can you succeed in a, in a post-COVID environment where the competition is greater than ever, where your margins are smaller than ever, where you're not even getting the shelf space that you need? Well, you got to get it back. And if, if your cases fail, if your plans of action fail, if the refund companies can't recover the money for you, 
you take Amazon to arbitration. That that is your that's your dispute resolution system as an Amazon seller. And as long as it is less than a million dollars that they owe you, it's a pretty good system. So how does it work? The first thing we always do before getting right into the trenches is we what we we draft what we call a pre-arbitration demand. And it really is a letter to Amazon's outside counsel explaining why Amazon owes you $50,000, $25,000, $300,000. We've resolved cases up to just under a million dollars by just pointing out why Amazon owes you the money, owes you the inventory. And by doing that, you're taking the issues out of Amazon staff in India, out of the hands of people in Ireland, out of their staff's hands in Costa Rica, and you're putting it right in their legal department in Seattle and their lawyers' hands in Seattle. It's a whole different kettle of fish where they really do an Amazon deep dive. They really do this stuff to figure out whether they should release the money to you, whether they owe you inventory, and a lot of these cases resolve. The cases that you don't resolve before getting into the fight you file the demand for arbitration. It really is just um, a, a document spelling out why Amazon owes you the money, why Amazon owes you the inventory, and you file it with the American Arbitration Association. Um, if the amount that Amazon has stolen from you is $50,000 or less, you could take advantage of the expedited process, which means you're going to be in and out within 90 days. You're entitled to a hearing within 30 days of the arbitrator being appointed. And it's a really great system to get your money back. If it is over $50,000 by uh, enough of an amount that it's worth going non-expedited, then you go non-expedited. But it really should be more like 75, 95, or over 100 um, because the costs and the time are more. If you have to go after Amazon, because it stole $150,000 of your inventory, um, you can do that. But instead of paying a flat fee for the arbitrator, uh, 600 bucks each side, you're going to get stuck paying the arbitrator an hourly rate. Most of them are anywhere from four to 600 bucks an hour. Uh, you do, you, you split that with Amazon, but there's no cap. So it takes longer, it costs more, but you really don't have any choice. That That is the mechanism to get your $200,000 that it refuses to release to you to get it back from Amazon. Um, I mentioned before that if it's uh, under a million dollars, it's a great system. If it's over a million dollars, it's awful. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why that is. Um, under the rules of the American Arbitration Association, either side, meaning either you or Amazon, if you're claiming over a million dollars, you can insist on a panel of three arbitrators, right? You're thinking, okay, three arbitrators, it's going to triple my cost, uh, but I'm sharing that with Amazon. Well, it doesn't just triple your cost. It actually quintuples your cost because not only are you paying each of these arbitrators to listen to every part of the case, you also pay these guys to talk with each other. So the cost really skyrocket. And that's where Amazon sellers kind of get screwed. If it's over a million dollars, you would be way better going to court because when you go to court, there's one judge and he's paid by the government, not by you. Um, but it is but it is. It is what it is. So whatever it is, whether it's expedited or non-expedited, the next step is an arbitrator selection process. You get a list of names. You do your research. If you do this yourself, we've got a whole database of all the different arbitrators we've been in front of which ones were sympathetic to Amazon sellers, which ones just seemed like they were in bed with Amazon and a whole lot in between. You exclude a couple if you have good grounds, then you number which ones you want in the order. Amazon does the same thing. When there's a match, that's your arbitrator. Um, the discovery process in arbitration is where both sides have to share information. In the expedited process, the discovery is pretty minimal but you can always finagle information that you need. If it's not expedited, it could be full blown with depositions and experts and documents and interrogatories. Uh, it does become almost identical to going to court. Um, eventually you will have a couple of conferences with the arbitrator and then you will get your hearing. And the hearings are 
really cool because the rules of evidence in court exist, but they're not really, really applied. So you can get away with a lot of stuff in an arbitration that you would never, ever get away with, you know, in a real courtroom. And then eventually the arbitrator says, thank you very much. You both do your closing arguments. You're all done. And you get a decision. If it's expedited, you're going to get that decision literally within two weeks of that hearing. If it's non-expedited, it takes a little bit longer, still way faster than court. And so I guess the point of this section uh, of the talk is that if you want to succeed post-COVID, you can't let Jeff or Jassy steal your money or steal your inventory. You got to try and recover it because the ROIs are just so much tighter and your returns are so much tighter. All right. Next thing I want to get into is people with private label brands. I don't even like using that term. It's a brand. OK, I don't care if it's your first shipment, your first pallet you're selling the small packages that you're getting in it is your brand and if you want to succeed you got to protect your sales you have to monitor your listings you have to create something that takes your product outside the first sale doctrine you have to stop everybody else from selling your product you have to protect your brand you also you need to protect your consumers all right consumers have a, a lot of choices nowadays and if you have landed a consumer to buy your product, the last thing you want them to have is a poor experience because they're getting your product from somebody else. Even if they're drop shipping it from you, you want to make sure you're protecting those consumers as much as possible. So this is a slide that my partner, Rob Siegel, who's a remarkable, remarkable lawyer that he developed. He doesn't know I'm using it. He'd be probably pretty pissed off if he knew I was, but whatever. Age has its privileges. So this is what we do for brand protection. We saw what like Red Points and, and Voris and E-Enforce and what these awful, awful companies and firms were doing is that they just make like buckshot complaints against Amazon sellers. And we thought it was really, really a, a terrible thing to do because they put a lot of people needlessly out of business. So this is the process that we use. I'm, I'm happy to share it with you guys because you can do a lot of this stuff yourself. First, you want to make sure that you have your data, you have your listings in order, you have your ASINs, you have an organized way of monitoring it. Um, we use software and people. We try and mimic what works at Amazon. But if you are a smaller brand and you only have five or 10 or 15 listings, you don't need to get fancy and crazy. You just need to check your ASINs, check your listings. Okay. Now, you find someone who's selling your products, send them a cease and desist letter, right? You could do it through your brand uh, registry dashboard saying you got to stop selling our products because you can't honor our warranty. You can't deliver the copyright material that we add to it. You can't do the same quality control that we're doing or the post sale services that we're doing and spell it out to your fellow seller why they have to stop. If you want a killer sample, Look at Jack Daniels' uh, cease and desist letter. It's absolutely killer. Um, you then want to make sure that you can identify who you're contacting. Okay, so uh, basically about a year ago, 18 months ago, when Amazon started revealing all of your identities and all of your addresses, you're protecting your brand. You want to use that material and reach out to them where they live, reach out to them where they work to let them know that you know who they are and those are the same things that law enforcement actually uses. But I'm not telling you to get the police involved. Uh, the next step in protecting your brand, you need the order numbers uh, from doing test buys. So we actually now have a whole warehouse system down the hall, okay, where we do our test buys. And you want to get the products, you want to get the number, and you also want to see where they're getting your products from, and you want to get better control over your distribution chain. Uh, through your brand registry uh, dashboard, you can report up to 100 ASINs and 100 hijackers to stop them if you need to. And I want to make sure um, that if you want to be successful, uh, that this is what you do. Don't make any bullshit complaints. If they're not selling counterfeit products, don't accuse them of it. You're opening yourself up to liability. It's needlessly putting their whole business at risk. Build something into your product that gives you legitimate reasons to knock them out and do it legitimately okay 
Don't make false counterfeit complaints. It is bad business, bad for you, bad for the ecosystem. Um, and eventually Amazon will ignore the complaints that you're making. So this is how we do brand protection for sellers all over the United States and, and a lot of international brands as well. All right. Next tip. I, I don't have my clock going. I hope I'm not going over. Or I'm not going too fast or too slow. Um, but diversification is, is the key to longevity in business. So while Amazon is still the giant elephant in the room compared to everybody else, you want to diversify your marketplaces. It adds value to your account. It protects you in the long haul. So get your products on eBay. Get your products on Walmart. If they fit into Etsy, get them on all the different platforms. You diversify. Now, we are seeing through the news on a practical daily basis the problems of getting goods from China into the United States and other places. So you really should diversify where you're getting your products from, okay? You don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. So look at India, okay? Look at indiasourcingtrip.net, okay? Look at having products made in Vietnam. Now, huge new problem. The products get made. You're actually getting your bandwidth. You're getting them shipped over here. You're paying twice the rate for your container. They get to the shores of Long Beach, right? And oh my God, you can't get them into the country, right? There are tons of ships. And I, I monitor this news and we talk, I probably personally talk to anywhere from 20 to 100 different brand owners every single week. One, because I love doing this and I work seven days a week. I, I find it fascinating. So the problem they're having is 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 so many so many wrinkles to it. So you get it manufactured, you get it shipped over, you can't get it onto the land, right? So then you get your products, they get the container off the ship and they're at the port. Well, now they have a problem because they're not allowing them to stack the containers high enough. Then you got the containers, right? Then you can't get not enough guys to get the containers onto the trucks. Then there's not enough trucks, then there's not enough truck drivers. Then the ones that actually get there is no one to unload the damn things that Chelsea was talking about. So there are multiple layers of problems that you are facing post COVID. So one of the things you can do is why don't you look for goods that are already in North America? Okay. I don't believe Canada has a big manufacturing source, but there's a ton of stuff being made in Mexico. And also what is old is new again. There are tons of manufacturers right here in the United States that you may want to look at. Your cost, yeah, okay? Your cost is going to be through the roof compared to the factories in China. Our labor just costs more money. Our real estate costs more money. But for the time being, in the post-COVID world, maybe you want to diversify a bit and get some of your goods that are already here because they're made here in the United States. So diversify your sales channels and your platforms, diversify your source of goods, and also you want to diversify your shipping issues by maybe taking some of your products and getting them made right here in the United States. All right. So um, many of you know me and my insanely awesome team of people for the plans of action that we write for Amazon sellers, listing suspensions account suspensions, used sold as new, inauthentic, high ODR, tracking number issues, you know, shelf space we're doing plans of action for. So here's the theme, documents, 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 and more and more documents. Um, at this time of year, Amazon always seems to dump more resources into the people that are reading your plans of action, but their time is still limited. When I went with Megla to India, I did a side trip to Hyderabad. It was a, a remarkable trip. It was a remarkable. Delhi was insane to see. The quality of products was insane. And just doing going by myself to Hyderabad, I went there and I interviewed dozens of Amazon staff. Uh, Amazon did not give me the okay, but I did it anyway. And their time is limited. They're looking for concise, persuasive plans of action. That is supported by documents. So it's old is new again. Uh, what is new is that Amazon is also calling you and asking you to give them verbal plans of action. 
So what we're hearing from the thousands of sellers is that they're getting phone calls and Amazon staff on the phone is like, okay, what's your root cause here? Right now, every plan of action, if you don't know this already, you got your root cause. Like, why is Amazon having an issue with you? Why is the consumer having an issue with you? Uh, number two, your immediate corrective action. And then the third section is like, what are you going to do to fix this? How are we not going to have a problem with you? And it's either long-term changes to your business or systemic changes to your business. Every single plan of action, same format, but now they're asking verbally. So have this ready if you for this phone call. And they call you, they'll tell you that if you're not ready for the call, they can call you back. But be prepared. What is the root cause? Why would a consumer think your product is used? Well, maybe another consumer bought it and it was returned back to Amazon and their staff just isn't equipped to get rid of the inventory. Maybe your packaging was last year's, whatever it is, but be prepared to know what the root cause of the problem is so you can verbalize it as they call you. If this increases to the point where my plan of action business goes down and now we're just helping you build your brands, that would be great. If you can get your listings back, your accounts back with a phone call, that, that would be fantastic because it's fast. Be prepared to tell them verbally that as soon as you knew there was a problem, you refunded the money, you told them to keep the product, you sent them another one, whatever it was, however you kissed the golden ring, do it. And also be prepared uh, with specifics during that phone call as to what changes you made to your business, who you hired with the name and the date, to, so Amazon staff can be re they can rest assured that it's not going to have the same problem with you in a week from now. And you really got to follow through. So that's that's probably the post covid breaking news update for plans of action. Be ready to do it verbally on the telephone with Amazon staff. So um, that that those are the things I want to talk to you about of what what I believe, you know, from our perspective, you know, we help thousands and thousands of sellers every single year with plans of action, listing suspensions, account suspensions, intellectual property issues. And I polled my team. I said, all right, what do you guys, what do you guys want to tell sellers to be prepared for post COVID success? And, and, and that was the list. <laughs>